welcome back to the stage, Casey Baker. I come from a line of very elegant women. My grandmother, my mother, Texas women. I remember growing up in my little years, spending time at my grandmother's house, and my grandmother had about four closets full of clothes and all these jewels. And I would go and sit at her little vanity, and I would dress myself up in her jewels and her powders and her perfume. And same thing with my mom. I remember she particularly had these little gold earrings with a little diamond in the center, and I was enchanted with them. And I would sit there and just look at them on my ears. And I was so enchanted with how beautiful my mother and my grandmother were and, and are. I remember that my mother always used to say to me, you know, if you're having a bad day, just put on your best dress and some lipstick, it'll be fine. <laughs> I still follow that advice, actually, sometimes. I must put on lipstick about 50 times a day. I just love putting on lipstick, and it's part of my Texas thing. I can't, I will never, ever want to break that habit. <laughs> But there was a bit of a secret in the women of my lineage. I remember when I was probably about my senior year of high school, my, I played hooky and I stayed home and I didn't think anybody knew that I was home. And I was incredibly surprised when upstairs in my room I heard a really strange noise in my house. And what I heard was the sound of a piano playing and a woman singing. And my sister had long since left the house. She was the one who played the piano and sang, so I was shocked. I walked down the stairs, and there in the living room was my mother playing the piano and singing so beautifully with so much passion and so much emotion and love. Something in me knew in that moment not to announce to her that I was there. I had never in my entire life heard my mother play the piano or sing. And so I was shocked. And I knew that I had to, there was something, I couldn't say anything, I had to keep this a secret. And so I went back upstairs and just sat with that for a long time in my life. And this was a really interesting time in my life that that happened because leading up to this, I was about as outgoing and gregarious as you could imagine. I had been running for office since I was like this big and was leader of this and leader of that and felt freedom to sing in the school plays and all this stuff. But that moment impacted me. I mean, it's taken me years for it really to see how much that impacted me. But I went on to college and I looked around at the world and I didn't see anybody who looked or felt like me as a leader in the world. I didn't see any women that looked like how I felt in my body, in my, my womanhood. I, I saw people who were very buttoned up, almost stiffer. I just couldn't relate to that. And so slowly but surely, I began to stop seeing myself as any kind of leader in the world. I just was like, I'm not what a leader looks like. I'm a little too funky. Maybe I'm a little too sexy, maybe I'm a little too, I don't know. It was just a layer of shame that I felt and self-doubt that began to take over my life. And I stopped speaking up, I stopped running for anything. I became very quiet. And even though on the outside it might have looked like I had a lot of really cool stuff going on. I worked for a couple US senators and I got a really prestigious job with an investment bank. Even in all those positions, I felt like there was a wall between me and whatever that was and whatever future that might potentially lead to. Now, I became really great growing up and being very well spoken about other people's ideas. Right? I was great at researching and putting other people's research together and then putting it together in a very powerful presentation. But when it came to expressing what I thought, what my ideas were, I felt like total no zone on that. It was just a wall of resistance inside myself and fear and doubt if it was really valuable and what might they think and 
So I retreated far, far inside myself. And by the time I was 24, in my first job at the investment bank, I was a super stressed out, anxiety ridden, lost, struggling young woman. And I left that job. I actually walked in one day and I just randomly quit with no other job. I don't know what the heck I was thinking. And I had a $1,400 a month of rent to pay in San Francisco. It was one way, in retrospect, it was very courageous. You could have also said in the moment it was really stupid. <laughs> and that was probably my parents' opinion, most definitely. But I had to do it. I had to somehow break out of something. I didn't know what. I felt so trapped. And I looked at the potential future, even though investment banking was like two years investment banking, and then you'll get your golden ticket into any business school you want, and then you can go on to be a CEO. I mean, as soon as I stepped into that investment bank after I had had the, the whining and the dining and the wooing, and maybe some of you know what I'm talking about that goes on when you're being sort of rushed for the job, I quickly discovered that this was no place where I wanted to be. No place that I wanted to be. And so I needed to make that break. I needed to make that break. Now, luckily, during that time, I was living in San Francisco, and I don't think you can live in San Francisco without somehow ending up at a yoga class or learning meditation. It's just in the air. And I found myself at Yoga Tree on Stanyon Street, and I started to go to yoga classes a couple times a week, three times a week. I started seeing a Buddhist therapist, and she introduced me to the concept of something called bare noting. Bare noting is when you notice what you are thinking without judging it. And that was a total world shifter for me. I was like, whoa, I'm thinking. Wow. <laughs> my whole life to that moment, I had just been in my thoughts the whole time. I had never had a moment of actual awareness. It was life changing and the light really started to come in at that time. So. I sold everything, and I'm not kidding, I sold everything. I had four closets of clothes, mostly from Neiman's. I didn't sell it, that's not true. I, I actually took probably three things to consignment and everything else went in these big garbage bags and I dumped them in front of Goodwill on Haight Street. And someone had, a, I'm sure, a really amazing shopping trip that day. And sometimes I feel a little regret about that because there were some amazing <laughs> things in there. <laughs> but I needed to do it. I really needed to do it. I needed to shed in my life. I bought a one-way ticket, and I took off traveling. I left the United States, and I took off traveling for about four years. And during that time, it was magic, and it was hard, but it was magic. I began to really be on a, a very intense spiritual quest to, to, to really know who I am. And during that time, I discovered something pretty awesome. I was in Thailand. There was a scene over there of people who were really into something that was very new to me called ecstatic dancing. And for the first time in my life, I experienced what it was like to just let my body do its thing. I had been a dancer growing up, but I'd always done choreography, right? Just like my speaking, other people's words, other people's moves. For the first time, I got to feel what it felt like to, to move. And, and it turns out that my body is really brilliant. I was just in awe. I would just watch with this new awareness of just seeing how this intelligence would flow through my body. It was just amazing. And the joy that I felt was just crazy off the hook. I began to really see that is just so deeply who I am. And the miraculous thing about that is that as that was happening, as I was coming home to my body and discovering this incredible world that is my body and music, I began to have these incredible downloads and insights and understandings. I began to really have this beautiful perspective on life and understanding of myself, this very uh, enlightened voice within, extremely wise. And I fell in love with this voice, big time, big time. This voice was the only thing in my 25-ish years that I had ever had a direct experience of, oh my gosh, this, this is divine. I fell so madly in love with this voice. This voice was guiding me in my life. And then it started, I started feeling, experiencing all this poetry and spoken word come through, all this creativity. Now here's the thing about the nature of, of, of wisdom and creativity when it comes through. It, it naturally wants to be seen. 
It naturally wants to be given. It wants to contribute. And that was how I felt. I saw out in the world suffering and things that had my heart ache, and I wanted to speak up about it. I wanted to share this wisdom and this creativity that was coming through, but I felt utterly trapped inside of myself. The fear that what if I share what is so beautiful within myself and other people don't find it beautiful? They don't find it even valuable. That was, that was an, I could not even go there. The terror of being completely rejected for this beauty inside was so much. And I began to become like a, a recluse in life. I backed away from my friends. I backed away from my family. I traveled alone. I was lost and suffering. I believe that our bodies manifest so much what it is that is going on with our minds and our energy. And my face broke out in the most intense cystic acne I imagine any of you have probably ever seen. I remember walking into a restaurant one day and there was a little girl with her dad and she looked at me and she looked at her dad and I overheard her say, what happened to her face? It was just like, you know, I had before that actually been a, a very, physically a very beautiful young woman and I felt like I had lost my beauty. I had lost my value in the world because I had known that that was valuable. That got me a lot in life, a lot of validation. So I felt like I had lost my beauty and yet there was this world of beauty inside that I so needed and longed to share, but felt that I couldn't. The shame was so intense. Luckily, life is such a friend. And I found myself a few years later in the Middle East. I was in Israel. Now, early in my travels, before all of this sad story began, I had met a man, a very special man. I had eight days with him, a Palestinian man named Kamal. It was a love that rocked my heart wide open, and I will never, ever forget that. And he had since, during the span of a couple of years between then, and I had been too ashamed to contact him or see him because of my skin, I knew that he had actually escaped the West Bank, literally with his best friend, had jumped over the wall at night, gotten an illegal visa to France, rode trains illegally through Europe, find, trying to find a country to give them asylum, and ended up in Sweden. Now, he found out that I was traveling to Israel, and he said, please, 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 will you visit my family? Please visit my family. And I was like, yes, I'll totally go to the West Bank. <laughs> This was three weeks after Arafat died. There were a lot of bombs going off. All of my Israeli friends were like, don't do it. I didn't tell my parents, but everything in my body knew, of course I'm going. This feels like a total yes. Felt beautiful inside. Just totally how I guide my life, that feeling. That's a yes. And so I went, I went to the wall. I was dropped off there. And literally, the wall is this huge concrete wall. It's a pen for all intents and purposes. And I walked through and this young woman met me on the other side. Jihan, she is my age. She is the youngest sister of Kamal, 14 brothers and sisters. She's brilliant. And we became fast friends. And she showed me life in the West Bank. Her whole family did, and it was awesome. I went to some amazing parties, all women. <laughs> rocking parties, like four to 104 years old, just rocking it, and got to see and experience things that I would never have dreamed before. And the, the, there's just so much misunderstanding about Palestinians in the media. These people took me in and loved me, the sweetest people, her family. She and I became very close, and one night we were lying in, in bed, and she said to me something that rocked me fast awake very quick. She said to me, Casey, there is so much that I dream of doing in my life. I want to travel. I want to I go and 
and study at an amazing university and get my master's degree in psychology and come back and help my people to deal with the intensity of the anger inside so they don't have to throw bombs. But I can't. I can't get a visa to leave. I can't get out of this wall. I feel like I'm being punished in this lifetime, is what she said. And I realized in that moment, beyond a shadow of a doubt, it was like cold water poured over me. I was just wide awake. Oh my God, what an incredible thing to have been born an American woman in this place and time. What an incredible thing. Anything that I dream, anything that I want to create, anything that I want to say, anything that I want to do, I can. I can. I am in every way in my life logistically free. The only place where I am trapped is in my mind. I'm living in a prison in my mind. In that moment, I was just completely solid. I knew right away what my work was in my life to set my mind free so that I can feel total freedom to stand up and speak, to simply share what's here inside, simply give of this beauty that's in here and contribute to the world in the ways that I long. And my mission became really clear in my life. And over the last many years, I cannot tell you the extraordinary amount of brilliant teachers and friends and teachings and experiences that I have had that have supported me in finding the freedom to stand here and speak before you today. But there is one that has been a very consistent teacher over and over again, and it, it is for me every day, frankly. And that is my relationship with death. Death is usually this thing that and I, and I know, I know for myself, I, I live in denial that it's, 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 it's coming. It is, it is coming. You know? And when you get real about it, when you get really real about it, and just surrender into the, yes, yes. And you know, in that moment, there is a truth that is beyond description of what a profound, flippin' miracle it is to be in this, right now, with this voice which, who knows, may never, ever, ever appear again in this particular manifestation ever throughout all eternity. When we can become intimate with the experience and the reality of our death, we can see that it's an incredible friend, actually. That there's incredible creative power in it to truly be yourself. To truly be yourself. Because I've known that when I look at my death, my death, and I ask, wow, yes, it's, this is, this is, this is, it's coming. I don't know when, but it, it is coming. And so, in my life, what is it that I must create? What is it that brings me so much joy that I must get out there in the world? And I find crystalline clarity and the courage, somehow the courage to move in that direction. It is, it is the ultimate clarifier. It is the ultimate liberator. Now, I really am enchanted with the work of Lady Gaga and, <laughs> and Steve Jobs. I live in San Francisco, and my, my fiancé is like crazy about Steve Jobs. I mean, we have like total Mac everywhere and everybody I know. And it's incredible. These two people, I really respect them. I mean, I enjoy their products, their art, their products, I mean, of course. But I am fascinated with these two people for the, the boldness with which they bring their creativity forth into the world as uniquely them, and birthing something that nobody's ever had concept of before. And both of them, both of them had extraordinary relationships with death. I remember seeing an interview with Lady Gaga some time ago on David Letterman, and she talks about how every morning she gets into an egg. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have heard about, that, about this, but she gets into an egg. And she sits and she sits in this egg and she says she goes through a process of actually just spiritually dying and being reborn and comes out with just crystalline clarity of what it is that's next for her to create and the gumption to go and do it. And Steve Jobs, I don't know if you've heard, when he passed away, his sister said that his last words were, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow. And that is a man who 
I know I spent years in, in exploring Buddhism and his relationship with death and dying and got, got a real curiosity about it. You know, a real curiosity about it. And with this kind of, like instead of moving away from death, we can actually move into, wow, yeah, it's coming, what is that like? And what do you have to teach me? What do you have to say? There is an extraordinary wisdom and freedom and courage that it grants us. A year and a half ago, I made a very bold commitment in my life. I went and sat at the, this beautiful place overlooking the San Francisco Bay with my fiance, David. I bought myself this little tiny diamond ring that I have right here underneath my grandmother's. It's a little tiny speck, it's very small, but it's, it's a little diamond. And I made a commitment that no matter what, I was going to support women full throttle in my life and unleashing the brilliance of their voices for the next 12 months of my life. And that kind of commitment births such magic, such magic. It has been the wildest, most incredible experience this last year and a half. I was gifted with this serendipitous, serendipitous experience of being invited to come to the Middle East and to support women from Dubai and Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and Lebanon in public speaking and finding their voices to speak up. It felt like this incredible poetry in my life for me to be able to go back there and do that. But definitely the most beautiful moment of my entire last year and a half was last September when I put on the first School for the Well-Spoken Woman Live. And there were seven women who believed so deeply in this vision and trusted me, even though I had never done it before, and who had a burning message to share. And one of those women was my mother. At 70 years old, my mother decided she would not go out of this world with her voice stuck inside her. And that was a beauty beyond description. I got to really see her in a way that I'd never seen her before, really as a woman. It was such a healing for her. It was such a healing for me. And it was a brilliant, epic talk. So I invite all of you to not let the beauty inside of you go out of this life unseen. We need it. We need it. And it's safe to let it out. Life will really support you. There's two Tibetan prayers that I want to share with you. Maybe one of them will become yours. The first one is one that I say every morning. Every morning. It goes like this. I am here to manifest the wisdom that lives within to share my loving compassion with the world and to gather the skill and the power to bless and empower all beings. And the second one is one that I want to share and, and also bless you with so much is that may all beings, may all of you enjoy profound, radiant glory. Thank you. Thank you.